Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9 The Bigger Picture. Imagine living in third world conditions with a soaring crime rate and half your neighbors addicted to drugs. Incredibly, it's happening right in our own backyard. Tonight, a 16 by 9 exclusive. Our Sean Mallon brings you the shocking story. They are specks of humanity on a vast frozen landscape. Tiny First Nations scattered in the far northwest of Ontario. They have names like Wapakika and Yabmatung, Kingfisher Lake and Kitchenamekasub and Inuwak. Accessible only by air for most of the year or ice road for a few fleeting weeks in winter. But the isolation has not shielded the people from a devastating import from the south. I was, I was sick and uh, I felt like I was dying. Prescription drug abuse, mainly OxyContin, is spiraling out of control. And the chief of the KI First Nation, Donnie Morris, says it's dwarfing the old afflictions of gas sniffing and alcoholism. This is different and it's worse. It cripples families, it's crippling communities, and especially the leadership to it. We just don't know how to deal with it. I say about 55, 55, 60 percent of the people on the reserve do use drugs that do have an addiction. We agreed to not identify this man or his home community. He says he first tried OxyContin at a party in his early 20s. It wrecked his life. I was averaging about $400 a day, doing whatever I can to get my fix, stealing from people, hurting people. I lost my job. I figured that uh, drugs were more important than working. It was a story we heard repeatedly as we toured northwestern Ontario. Reserve after reserve told us that, astoundingly, more than half their people were hooked. Imagine the outcry if half the people of Toronto or Vancouver were addicted to a drug. People go without, no shelter, no food. And uh, I think there's a lot of abuse that goes along with that too, right? OxyContin is an extremely addictive painkiller. Abuse is already a problem in the South, where pills sold illicitly go for $80 each. But up north, a single tablet goes for a stunning $400. Dealers sell a quarter pill for $100. This in communities where unemployment often tops 70% and many live on welfare. Addictions in all their forms have scarred First Nations for generations. But this is something new and insidious, exploding in just the last few years and local leaders are powerless to stop the flow of drugs into their communities. That's a baby's blanket, isn't it? Yeah, there's an oxy right here. In Kingfisher Lake, Chief James Mamaqua showed us just how brazen smugglers have become. Is that a real oxy? Yes, those are prescription drugs hidden in a baby's blanket. The tiny local police forces try to do checks of vehicles coming in on the ice roads, and the regional airlines are talking about baggage inspections, but they can't keep up. Chief Morris says gangs in Thunder Bay and Winnipeg are now in on the act. It's organized now, trying to take all the money out of our communities and make them dependent uh, on them to supply drugs. The regional superintendent for the Ontario Provincial Police, Ron Van Stralen, says they have made some busts and managed in some places to choke off supply to a trickle, sending prices skyrocketing. We heard 400, but yeah. you're hearing up to 12 or 1600 dollars yeah. for one for oxy one oxycotton. It's kind of a funny way of measuring success, though. It's I guess. a terrible way to measure success, but it is something. So mix in poor people addicted to expensive drugs, and the result is inevitably crime. Chief Mamaqua says his community has been hit with a rash of break-ins and thefts. Does anyone in Ottawa know what this is going on <clears throat> and I taking guess. an interest in this? I'm sure somebody does down there. I'm not sure if they can <laughs> say the truth. You have to change the concept of where you're coming from. At the KI First Nation, they're not waiting for help from Ottawa. They set up their own detox center, funded from their own limited resources. It's our community problem, and as a community, I think we should deal with it. A half dozen people go through every month. It's cold turkey withdrawal, with some counseling mixed in with traditional healing methods. Well, my babies grew up half of the time with me being high. Melanie Beardy has four children, aged 1 to 13. She's been using for five years and says her two youngest have never seen her sober. All my income would go to that. 
and <clears throat> what I was depending on my family to feed my kids. She's here to change that, but kicking an addiction to OxyContin is no easy matter. I'm still thinking, what's one more line, right? One more, how would it feel? So now you're just about ready to graduate from here. You think you're gonna make it? Think you're gonna be able to stay off this stuff? You know, honestly, I believe I can do it. Coming up on 16 by 9. You quoted a number of 500 violent crime yeah. incidents? Per year. Per year. Yeah. 500 in a community of what, 2,700? 2,700. 500 violent crimes a year. Yeah. That's all coming up. Welcome back to 16 by 9, the bigger picture. Entire communities in the frozen north where children are raised in filth and residents live without hope. Here again is our Sean Mallon with a first-hand look at one of the worst places to live in Canada. If ever there was a place with an ironic name, it is Fort Hope, a First Nation in northwestern Ontario where the living conditions are third world. I first visited here in 1989 and this is part of the story I told back then. On the shores of Lake Yadmut, you can see Canadian landscapes of exquisite beauty. You can also see diapered children playing in a filthy ditch. And you can see the home of Zacharias and Charlotte Misitiwajasik, a tiny bungalow where 16 people live. It's hard to believe that people live in a place like that in a country as rich as Canada. But when I returned to Fort Hope in 2011, two decades later, I found that if anything, things are worse. How come you got the tarp over there? This is Louis Sugarhead, and this is where his family lives, all 10 of them. The door is, uh, the door is not 100%, so, so it's I really... I can see yeah. right inside. Despite being one of the lucky few in the community with a job, this is the best home Sugarhead can afford. With all those mouths to feed and a chronic housing shortage, this is as good as it gets. So what's it like living with all those people in this little house? It's pretty stressful at times, especially when you have kids crying all at once. Only a thin layer of plastic separates the family from the brutal cold outside. And the inside is filthy with mold, missing walls, and broken windows. Falling apart, eh? Not a good way to raise kids? Um. I guess, in a way, I guess it's not really a good, a good thing for them. The one sign of hope for this community in 1989 was the bright new school and the promise of something better for the children. Today, the school is still there, but listen to the update from band manager Andrew Yesno. The school was set on fire in the fall. Even your school was set on fire? Yeah. That was when Fort Hope hit bottom. A wave of arsons ripped through the community. 12 buildings torched, the old band office was hit, and at this home, the residents barely escaped with their lives. Uh, this house was occupied by um, one of the local ministers. He got up in the middle of the night to make some tea. Uh, he smelled something. He opened up the room door and uh, the fire burst up in front of him. Uh, that was probably the final straw where they firebombed the, the house with the people sleeping inside. The band declared a state of emergency. The local native-run police force was overwhelmed. Constable Jason Baxter was in the middle of it. We'd have, within five days span, we'd have 20 to 30 calls for service. Um, we'd have everything arsons, we had a couple homicides, um, assaults, uh, a lot of public talks. Desperate, the band called in the Ontario Provincial Police for backup, and things have settled down for now. I think we stabilized what was happening, but uh, we haven't uh, solved anything. How do you keep up spirits when you're dealing with this kind of stuff? I don't know. It's hard. You go home and you struggle every day and you're wiped out. But you hope the next day is going to be a little bit better than the last. Just over the horizon is the possibility of better times. A giant mining play nicknamed the Ring of Fire is booming on the edge of Fort Hope's traditional lands. Prospectors have found rich deposits of chromite, a key element in stainless steel, possibly gold and copper too. But band councillor Charlie O'Keese says his people aren't getting any real benefit from what could be a multi-billion dollar development. Not right now because uh, the government's not even, uh, they don't even know we exist up here. 
they don't even tell us that there is, you know, there is this activity that's taking place up north there. All of which leaves Louis Sugarhead and his family stuck in their deplorable house with little prospect of anything better. Do you think people pay enough, enough attention to this kind of thing in the south? Not really. If they what? did, if they did, uh, if they did, then I wouldn't be living in this situation. But as bad as the conditions are here in Fort Hope, we are about to go to a place that's worse. We ended our tour in Pekanjikum, which might just be Canada's most dysfunctional community, a place stained by tragedy, hobbled by misfortune, and suffering from an astonishing level of violence. Like I've been to other reserves, and it's not, no comparison to here. Sergeant Jack McKay has been policing this region for 28 years and says Pekanjikum is by far his most difficult assignment. Last year, we almost had 5,000 occurrences. 5,000? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many people in this community? Uh, it's got to be 2,500 plus. So it's two occurrences per person here, Probably, basically. Yeah, basically, if you look at it that way, yes. It's the most difficult spot, and it's the, the spot, in my opinion, in this area that needed the most care. Regional OPP Superintendent Ron Van Stralen keeps a close eye on Pekanjikum, and for a good reason. What his officers deal with here is hard to believe. You quoted a number of 500 violent crime yeah. incidents. In what year was yeah. that? Uh, that was in 2008 and 2009, 2010. Over those three years? No, no, you know, per year. Per year? Yeah. 500 in a community of what, 2,700? 2,700. 500 violent crimes a year? Yeah. To put it into perspective, that crime rate in Greater Toronto would mean more than a million violent crimes a year. And then there was the incident that happened last June 30th, 2010, at this building, the former police detachment. Accounts vary as to what actually happened, but it appears that a deaf man was arrested by a police officer. There's a report that the man tried to grab the officer's pistol and the policeman hit him to fend him off. Not long after, 200 people arrived here, surrounded the building, and they were angry. To be honest with you, yeah, it was a tough day. McKay was one of the officers in the middle of it. The mob literally marched the whole detachment of cops two kilometers out to the airport. I think there were a couple of rocks, to be honest, that were thrown towards us. Yeah, but then by the arm, like sticks or bats, I did not see that. No. Mm. Pretty angry, though. Were they? That? They were pretty angry. Yes, they were, to be honest. Yes, they were. Crime, rampant alcoholism, and gas sniffing make Pekanjikum a tough place to raise kids. The vice principal at the local school, Barry Owen, worries about the children, the ones he teaches, and the six of his own. So always be aware, 24-7. You have to see it every day. Yeah. It, keep a close eye on your kids? Yeah. In the last decade, Pekanjikum became known for its high rate of youth suicide. In 2009, 14 killed themselves, a rate more than 30 times higher than the national average. Some are my former students, two of them. Took a toll on me when I heard it. Principal Joanne Donnelly gave me a tour of the school. With all the problems in the community, it's not surprising that only about half the 800 school-aged kids attend class on most days. We have kids who call and say that they can't come to school because they have to watch the house because they're afraid that they'll be broken into by the gas snippers in town. For those who do show up, the facilities are woefully inadequate. Yeah, it's kind of appalling. <laughs> it's embarrassing. The old school burned down in 2007, and there's no sign Ottawa is ready to build a new one, leaving the children in cold, rickety portables that were supposed to be temporary. They've all got very, very poor insulation in it, so we're just like every other day we've got frozen pipes or really? furnaces not working. Like this one here, the pipes have burst in there like four times in the last <laughs> like month. No gym, no library, no cafeteria, even the bare necessities are missing. What do you do about this? You build a school. You Start need a school, a school, I guess. But perhaps most appalling is the building specially designed for special needs kids. It's been closed since November because of a fuel spill. Well, kids are just supposed to be in here. Like they, we have kids who are blind, who are kids who are globally delayed, who are in wheelchairs or everything else, and they can't come to school. We wanted to ask the chief and council about all these issues. We called several times in advance with no response. And when we went to the band office, we hit a stone wall. Shut up the cameras until yeah. you go to yeah, yeah. the... Uh, 
After waiting for a few minutes, we were advised to go into a meeting room to ask for an interview. Are you in the bank council, sir? No. Oh, okay. I'm the enforcer. You're the enforcer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We were told an elder had died and they were in mourning, so no interviews. Can anyone give clearance to talk here? I guess I'd have to come for the council. But, like I said, uh, they don't want to talk about us. Nobody wants that's, to talk. That's final. And that was that. We headed for the airstrip and took off for home. Pekanjikum keeps its secrets from outsiders. Its fellow First Nation Fort Hope cries out for help, but wonders if anyone is listening.